Yeah, I need something in my life other than political science. Okay, I mean, I can't read like Tolstoy and do politics in my. You know, I need fun. Hello, and welcome to the debut episode of the Settlers of Soul podcast, a long-form interview show where we highlight the diversity and character of the international community residing in the city and beyond. I'm your host, Arius Dare. Non-Koreans make up just 3% of the population of South Korea, but this number increases every year. I myself am one of them. It is a diverse community of language instructors, engineers, academics, professional gamers, journalists, small business owners, and much, much more. We hope this show will serve as a showcase of this vibrant and growing expat population, and that it will provide insight and information for those with any interest in South Korea and the region. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also visit our website at settlersofsoul.com for guest bios, show notes, and transcripts. Okay, let's get to our first guest. Just a week before his now infamous BBC interview, I sat down with Robert Kelly to discuss international relations, South Korean politics, how to deal with North Korea, what it's like being a professor in Korea, and many other things that I hope you'll enjoy. Without further ado, here's Dr. Robert Kelly. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kelly. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So I'd like to actually start with what initially drew you to Korea in the first place. How did you end up writing uh, so much about Korea, about Japan, about China, uh, about Northeast Asian security? Sure. Well, I have a PhD in political science. That was about 10, 12 years ago. Um, so this is my discipline anyway, just sort of by, by choice from going back many years. I considered also being a historian back at the time when I went to graduate school. Fortuitously, when I was a graduate student, or when I was a graduate assistant, when I was teaching, I had a Korean exchange student, and uh, he took several of my classes, and we got to know each other in the course of time when I was at Ohio State. Um, after my courses, he and I became somewhat good friends and stuff like that. And um, so after I had finished my PhD, when I was sort of on the job market and I was looking around, I considered Korean options that I probably wouldn't have thought of, in part because I had this very good friend. I mean, I still talk to him now. I mean, this guy's been my friend for 20 years. He's one of my closest friends. He lives in Cheonan. And um, and so that encouraged me to actually sort of think about coming here in a way that I hadn't before. Um, I was also more mobile at the time. I was single. I didn't have kids, stuff like that. Um, I was teaching in a small school that was sort of not particularly much here or there. It wasn't really a big thing either way. And so there was uh, flexibility for me to come here, and so I did. Uh, I had originally expected, and my dissertation is actually in the area of international political economy, I originally expected I would be an IPE scholar, but there is a huge demand in Korea for people who write about security, Northeast Asian security, and not just in Korea, but in the region generally. And that's increasing because of China's really dramatic rise, right? And North Korea is continuing intransigence. And so I would constantly be solicited to write about this, to talk about this and stuff like that. And so, I mean, part of it is interest. I mean, I, you know, I'd studied security as well when I was at Ohio State. I didn't think I was going to go down that route too much, but there's just an enormous pull. There's just this really strong gravitational pull to write on this stuff out here. And um, I just got sort of sucked deeper and deeper into it. And I, I guess I've turned out to be better at it than I thought I would. And um, so I do this now more than I do... Um, political economy. I do actually write, I do actually continue to write on political economy. I work with the Economist Intelligence Group and do some other things. But, um, but I mean, the dominant, I mean, this isn't, I think it's not a big surprise. The dominant discourse out here is, is security, right? I mean, this isn't sort of North America where it's all about NAFTA and trade or, you know, Europe where it's all about, you know, trade, although I guess that's changing too. You know, I mean, in Asia, it really is very much sort of like classic 19th century kind of interstate security issues, you know, big states with big economies sort of arguing over territory and things like that. And so security really dominates the discussion of international relations in this part of the world. So you've been here about eight or nine years? Yeah, that's right. I came here in, um, what, 2008? And when you first got here, uh, let's back up, actually. When you first realized that you were going to be moving out to South Korea, I mean, even eight years ago, it was a very different country. What were your initial expectations? Uh, how did you see yourself uh, in the job? How did you see yourself living in society? Was it just you're going to live here for a year, maybe get some experience, pick up a language, and then move back? Or... Did you really envision yourself living here permanently? Um, I had anticipated I would probably not be here as long as I have been. Um, that's actually a good question. I hadn't actually thought about that too much. Yeah, I guess I had thought that I would be here for maybe maybe through my associate professorship. I'm almost a full professor at PNU. Um, I've, I've sort of come a fairly long way. But uh, yeah, I, I did. I sort of assumed that I would um, come here, sort of immerse myself, pick up the language like you said, sort of punch out some stuff and then possibly move on. But um it's turned out to be a better gig than I had expected. In what ways? 
Well, I mean, you can do a fair amount with it. Um, you know, I mean, I get it's nice. I mean, actually, you know, Korea, Korea takes academics seriously in a way America does not. You know, I mean, the United States academics are sort of seen as like, you know, these kind of experts that got America into all these sort of like terrible foreign policy concerns this is the kind of stuff that helped get Donald Trump elected. They're right? the writers of fake news. Yeah, it's stuff like that, right? Polls. Right, right. You know, I mean, in the United States, academia is also, um, particularly for American conservatives, academia is sort of like this sort of hostile liberal force and stuff like that. And it's true, American academia is very much left of center. But this also, what this does, though, in the sort of the polarization, the political polarization over academia in the United States means that American academics just don't have the kind of sort of like social stature that they do in Korea. In Korea, I mean, they, you know, being an academic is really sort of like socially prestigious, which I'm actually really surprised about. I mean, I grew up, you know, in the United States where it's like academics are sort of like eggheads. And here you really are, you're kind of treated as like a rock star, which actually is sort of pretty shocking to me. I'm not really sure that we deserve that, actually. But So does that translate into more opportunities at your university? Yeah, I think Great, so. Greater research autonomy? What, what are some tangible so. benefits of that? Well, I mean, I, I would probably, probably, that's actually a good question, too. I would probably say opportunities outside of the the strict university system. So, like, you know, the way I was trained, it's sort of, like, all about writing for academic journals that other scholars are going to read, which in practice means writing for stuff that very few people read. And I do that kind of stuff. But one of the things, as you said, about being sort of a foreign academic, being an Anglophone academic in Korea, is that you get solicited to do a lot of stuff. And so I do a lot of external writing. Um, like I said, I've worked for, I worked with CSIS, the Center for International, uh, Strategic International Studies. I've worked with the Economist Intelligence Unit. I've worked with um, the National Interest. I write for them. Um, I work with a think tank in Australia. I think I've gotten a bunch of grants that I probably wouldn't have if I were still in the United States and just some sort of like, you know, mid-range place. Um, and so being a, being a Western academic here, yeah, has actually opened doors. I mean, it's actually a pretty good gig. And there, I mean, there are a growing number of people out here who do that. I mean, I know a whole bunch of friends who do this kind of stuff too. Um, you know, if, and if Korean universities would open up and be more genuinely internationalized and bilingual, they could actually get a real surge of people in here. But the Korean the Korean university system, I think, kind of needs to catch up a little bit. They need to internationalize better. As I mentioned previously, uh, we're actually in Busan now. I know that the podcast is called Settlers of Seoul. So I hope that our listeners will forgive this little transgression here. You mentioned the internationalization of, of universities. And in our past conversations, uh, something that comes up often is the differences between, say, Busan and Seoul. So specifically from an academic perspective and how that relates to internationalization, what do you think people don't understand about the differences between Busan and Seoul? I think statistically speaking, if you just look at population numbers, you look at demographics, you look at technology, right? Busan seems as modern, as big, as relevant uh, as Seoul would be. Uh, in our previous conversations, this is something that you've actually disagreed on. What are some limitations that you think exist living in a city that's not Seoul? Yeah, that's I mean that's actually the biggest issue, arguably, in my in my own career and my own sort of profession because. Most of the people who I work with, most of the people I think who read my stuff and who are interested in are in Seoul just because Seoul is the national capital and that's – and I write about international affairs. You know, if I wrote about the Korean shipping industry or Korean, you know, regional politics or the domestic politics or something, you know, I don't know anything about like the Korean banking system or the court system and that's just not my area. You know, it would probably be easier being here but because of what I do, international relations, ultimately what really matters is diplomacy and a lot – all that's conducted out of Seoul and so just the sheer the, – just the geographic issue is is a, a handicap. It's not a terrible handicap. I mean I can always get on the train and go to Seoul and I do that several times a year. And, you know, I've learned to sort of work around it. Um, I mean this is a general issue in Korea I think more broadly, right, and that is that Korea is really, really over-centralized. Just about everything in Korean life takes place in Seoul, right? I mean, you know, no matter what your field, the place to go is Korea, is Seoul, right? I mean, if you're in music, the best orchestras are up there, right? If you, you know, want to be an academic, the best universities are up there, the sky schools. If you want to be, you know, in politics, you basically have to go there, right? I mean, who knows who the mayor of Busan is, right? But everybody knows what's going on in Gyeonggi province. I mean, that's just the way sort of South Korea is. I would argue that that's actually really bad for South Korea in a whole bunch of ways. I would argue that regional equity is something that will be really good for Korea, be good for Korea's national security, not to be so clustered in Seoul. It would be fair to Koreans who don't live in Seoul that they actually feel a little bit more equality with people who do. So you don't have this kind of like geographic stratification where Seoulites basically dominate the rest of the country, which encourages everybody to move to Seoul, right? And we've now got 55% of the population living in Gyeonggi, which is just extraordinary well, density. Seoul, Seoul and Gyeonggi. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, the whole 
the Seoul Kyungi Incheon corridor is now something like 55% of the population, which is just insane over centralization. But but I mean, if you you know, I mean, if you're if you're not in the particular area that I am, I mean, Busan is fine. I mean, it's a major metropolis of four million people, and it's got all the kind of things you want. It's got baseball teams and beaches, and you know, I go to the orchestra a lot here, and they're good and. You know, they've got what you need and they got schools and museums and stuff like that and nightlife and stuff. So, no, I mean, Busan is fine. It's really just sort of a question of whether or not the Korean government inevitably, you know, at some point wants to take decentralization more seriously. It's not really so much Busan. It's really, you know, do Seoul elites want to share the benefits that are in Seoul with the rest of the country, which I would argue is the equitable democratic thing to do. Have you been involved in any of those decentralization Me? Uh, discussions like for example oh. have you have you ever uh talked with policymakers here in busan about oh. ways that you can make the city more attractive uh, more competitive i have um i've a little bit a little bit i used to get invited to a couple of those things you know not really so much anymore um but yes i yeah i've argued a number of things about how to make busan um i think a little bit more foreigner friendly so, among other things i mean it would be you know it would be helpful for example if there was um more Korean language training or something like that, although my understanding is the city has moved on that. It would be helpful if Korean educational institutions were more genuinely internationalized and bilingual so that foreigners could sort of interact and not worry about their kids, particularly going through the system. You know, I have two kids. My wife's a Korean, right? They're going to speak very good Korean. They're going through Korean schools. And I have sort of concerns about are they going to be able to speak to me and how good is their English and stuff like that. And there are things that Busan could do. But part of that is just sort of the, I think the uh, the core of foreigners who live in Seoul provides enough density that you've actually got real sort of cosmopolitanism in Seoul, right? And you've just got so many people, so many foreigners living there, U.S. military contractors, foreign companies, students and stuff like that, that you really have that kind of diversity or whatever in, in Seoul. And Busan just doesn't have enough people. It just needs to have sort of like a greater pull. Right now, what you have really is, as I understand it, I'm not an expert in Busan's demographics, but as I understand it, what you've got is sort of a business community living down near the water and then sort of other people sort of sprinkled throughout the city, kind of like myself. Um, You know, I'm not really very plugged into the English language community in Busan, in part because it's really sort of scattered and fragmented and there's no sort of real core for it. Um, Whereas in Seoul, I mean, there's a lot of that stuff, right? You can belong to the American Chamber of Commerce and stuff like that. And that stuff's just, it's just not as strong down here. Have you felt that Busan National University has pushed you to publish or pursue a particular research track that you didn't consider before? Um, I don't think the university pushes me. I think it's more been a question of demand. This is a sort of demand side pull as opposed to supply side push, I suppose. That is to say that it's not the university saying you need to go and do this and this and this. It's more just the uh, the general interest of Korean journals and Korean conferences and associations and American journals and their focus on Northeast Asia. It's all, it's, it's mostly about security. And so there's just, I just get a lot of solicitation on this kind of stuff. I get, I mean, I do, I write for a lot of places. I do a lot of consulting and that's always what they want to talk about. Again, I do some IPE stuff, but there's just, there's just a huge demand for it. And that has pulled me deeper and deeper into it. I get you know, solicited to do book reviews. I've gotten grants and stuff like that. And almost all of it turns on sort of North Korean behavior and the rise of China. What is it like working at a Korean university as a as a non-Korean academic? Do you feel that you have more autonomy, more restriction? It's actually a lot like being at home in the United States insofar as the Korean university system like a lot of other things in Korea is patterned after American models because we're the ones who sort of put the place back on its feet in the 40s and the 50s, right? Just like the Korean government sort of looks like the American constitution sort of the same thing here right you've got the same basic sort of tenure track and you know the same sort of you know course loads and same kinds of debates you know one thing i do like about korean academia is it doesn't at least my department and the ones of friends of mine is that they're not sort of as politicized and factionalized as departments back home right i mean this is a problem at least in political science i know you know, you have sort of like factions and departments on political issues and methodological especially methodology um i don't see that so much here I, you know, my experience is limited just to sort of people I know on my own, my own time. But, um, yeah, you know, in, in my discussions with other people and, and things that I've read, it seems, in fact, there is actually quite big differences in how South Koreans view the North Korea issue specifically, and that you have this, these kind of camps, say, between hawks and doves, right. yeah, and true. then that division then separates into other things. Right now, is that is that just in the political science department? Is that just at some universities? Is that not an issue? I would guess that that is probably an issue at the very best universities in the country, right? The Sky Schools, PNU is not in there. PNU is, I don't know what, it's like a top 15 university or something It's a top 10. It's, um, I mean, since we are in Korea and rankings really do matter, uh, I think that PNU is the second highest ranked public university after Seoul National University. Oh. 
Okay. So that that's quite good. I, I any national university has a has a quite a good reputation, right. no matter where it is here. Right. Oh, I I can all I, I well I can speak most directly to the, the experience in my department. I don't want to get into that too much. I don't want to be too public about that. And the 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 big division I suppose in our department is over North Korea, and that's something that we studiously avoid talking about. My sense is that applies in most political science departments in Korea, and that shouldn't be surprising because it's a huge issue that divides the entire country. It turns their politics upside down too. Um, we have eight people in our department and our department is sort of split pretty much right down the middle between hawks and doves, you know, but in the interest of amity and comedy, that's just not something that we really get into and stuff like that. No, I've, I've generally found that we just don't have those kinds of sort of like big methodological and political disputes. There's a real effort to sort of like groom like a team spirit and stuff like that. That's something I didn't really see in the United States. You know, we do, I actually credit the Koreans for doing this. This is something Americans really could learn is that, you know, our department, at least in our department, I mean, they really go out of their way to, like, provide, like, a student environment. You know, they, they have, like, student hikes and, you know, with the whole department. And we go to dinners and they have, like, presentations, stuff like that. And they really go out of the way, out of their way to try to create this idea that you, like, belong to this community. You know, when I was an undergraduate, I went to Miami of Ohio, which is a little north of Cincinnati. Um, it's a good school. They used to call it a public ivy. I don't know what that means. But, you know, I was just a major... <laughs> I mean, I did okay. I mean, I got good grades and whatever, and I got to know some of the professors, and I enjoyed it. But the department never sort of, like, sent out mailers or – I mean, this was before email. I mean, they never sort of, like, called us up and said, you know, hey, we're going to have, like, a big department dinner, and you should all come and get to know the other majors. And we never did anything like that. I was just a – it was just like a bureaucratic box I sort of ticked through. I mean, I had friends and whatever, but all the relationships I had were outside the department. I knew a few majors here and there. People were my friends. But there was no effort to sort of groom, like, a political science community, which in retrospect – I mean, at the time, I didn't know I was missing out because I had no idea. But in retrospect, I wish the department had done that. I'm actually quite impressed at the way Korean universities really tried to do that, right? I mean, it would have been nice if I'd had some seniors telling me what to do when I was a freshman. No, it, I, mean, the, I had no idea. Is that <laughs> extended to you as the... As yeah, the yeah, sure. No, I'm a part of that. Name? Yeah, no, no I'm, I'm a part of that. I should say. No, I'm, I'm a part of that. I get, I, you know, I go to all these things. I mean, the biggest issue is sort of the language barrier. Um, you know, my Korean isn't as good as it should be. Um, this is something where Korean universities, I think... Korean universities are fast approaching a decision point about how they want to deal with this issue. There's sort of two ways to go on this. The one is sort of like Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan sort of route, which is you build genuinely bilingual universities and you invite in a whole wave of foreigners who are allowed to speak their own languages, mostly, which means mostly English and then, you know, maybe Chinese or French or German or something a little bit. But basically you set up sort of like like a, like a parallel track, a big parallel track inside the school that allows – foreign professors to operate and then that sucks in foreign students too and you get real internationalization the other track would be that korean universities simply decide they're going to fork up the money to really start training their faculty in korean um the problem with that is that it's really expensive because korean is so much so difficult for for western language learners um you know this isn't a question of sort of you know americans learning spanish and speaking spanglish after a year or something like that right i mean the 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 gaps the linguistic space between English and, and, you know, Romance languages generally, Indo-European languages generally, is really wide, right? It takes a lot of work to learn Korean. And, you know, if you're going to have professors coming in, they're probably people in their, you know, 30s, something like that. They're really not sort of learning languages anymore. They're thinking about, you know, writing their articles and getting tenure and their kids and these kinds of things. So if you're going to give them language training, you got to give them course releases, you got to give them publication releases, you got to hire them, you know, really high qualified teachers and stuff like that. You can't just sort of throw them into a program administered by a bunch of, you know, TAs and master's candidates and stuff like that. And that's sort of where the Koreans are right now. That's still sort of how they teach their language, right? That's just not enough. That's just right. not enough. You've got to have really, you got to have like real scientific training, like real immersion for two years with really good instruction. And so that's, I think that's where Korean universities really are. It's like, do they want to go down this route where they start spending serious cash to train foreign faculty to integrate into a Korean system? That would be expensive. Or do they want to sort of go the parallel track route? You know, and you can see, like, if you go to like the National University of Singapore, for example, and that's basically what it is, right? right? You know, or um, like Hong Kong University, right? I and mean, they've all got these, basically, they have sort of parallel tracks. That allows uh, Western faculty to operate. You know, I'm just not. I'm just not sure. PNU is sort of at that point too, and I've made sure. this argument repeatedly to the bureaucracy of PNU, and the answer is always sort of like, "Well, we'll think about it." And since you've been writing on this region for close to a decade now, I'm curious: in what major ways has the field changed, or the discussion changed, the narrative changed since 2008? That is a really good question. I'm not sure that the field has changed in the sense that you still have a lot of sort of people coming through political science, history, economics, maybe sociology who are interested in North Korea. 
Um, there's a lot of focus on it, you know, so I'm not really sure that the discipline has changed. Um, has your writing changed? Uh, has the themes in how you relate to, sure. say, uh, Seoul and Tokyo relations or North Korea, sure. for example, ha- have they changed dramatically yeah, in the I, last decade? I think what, what I think what I think has changed is sort of the, the general a widening recognition that North Korea is probably not going to change and probably not take engagement, accommodation, and so on. Seriously, I think the long-term trend in this debate is running against the doves. And, and and I don't say that because that is my own position. It is my own position, but I'm not actually saying that sort of to, to manipulate the data. I genuinely actually believe that. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm actually not much in a, of a supporter of engagement with North Korea any longer myself. You know, I think the highlight of sort of engagement was the the late 90s, the greed framework, and then the early 2000s, so the, the aughts or whatever we're supposed to call them the sunshine policy and stuff like that. And uh, through the sunshine policy period, the North Koreans continued to work on their nuclear and missile programs and continue to do a lot of the stuff that makes North Korea such a pariah, you know, the drug running and the counterfeiting and stuff like that. I mean, the North Koreans just didn't really change their behavior very much, right? And I think this is, um, that doesn't mean, I suppose that doesn't mean a deal is impossible. We can still, you know, talk to them. And there are a lot of good people out there who advocate that we should continue to talk to them. But I think North Korea's behavior, particularly during the sunshine period, really did a lot to sort of swing the middle to suggest that no matter what you offer the North Koreans, no matter what kind of diplomatic you know cover you offer them at the UN and you know the the money coming through the Kaesong Industrial Zone, which has since been closed, that they're, they're just not going to pull over much, right? I mean, what everybody's waiting for is for the North Koreans to show some kind of liberalization, you know, so close the camps or you know uh, allow a multi-party election maybe even at the local level or something like that right or you know lighten up on the you know the orwellian spying on their own citizens i mean well, pe- that, I think people are argue. looking for people are looking for some kind of change whatever it might be something sort of substantive and it can't just be oh you know they they exported less of this or that one month to china or you know they they didn't send so much meth to indonesia this month i mean it's got to be something Genuine and substantial. And in lieu of that, because the North Koreans really haven't done that, right? And the switch from Kim Jong-il to Kim Jong-un. No, I, th- I, think, was I think you could absolutely, absolutely argue that they have really embraced capitalism and free markets in ways that I don't think oh. anybody could have anticipated in the last 20 years Whoa. on a very national level in a way that the state is no longer the main primary provider I would not, for many, many families. Okay, I would not – well, that that's another – big issue i wouldn't really read that as liberalization i would read that as sort of like informal tolerated sort of crony capitalism at best from below i mean i don't know there's sort of a big debate about how to read that i'm yeah obviously i'm, I'm aware of it this whole sort of marketization from below in the state is sort of looking the other way and stuff and the public distribution system has collapsed so the state kind of tolerates this stuff because otherwise you have you know famine and dislocation again i i mean i get it but i'm not really sure if that actually constitutes like a like a conscious political decision by North Korea to be a less nasty regime. I think it's just something that kind of happened and the regime realized realized was wise to simply tolerate because it prevented the kinds of dislocations of the late 90s, the famine, that could jeopardize the regime, right? The regime doesn't want ca- – I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if you want to have this debate about North Korea, but I don't think the regime actually wants market-based capitalism. I think the regime realizes that it needs to tolerate some of that because the alternative is what happened in the late 1990s when you had something like 5 to 10% of the population die in three years. And that, even though the North Korean regime doesn't care about its own people, they don't actually care if 20% of the population falls over dead. They don't. What they care about, what, what does matter, though, is that when you have that level of social disruption, the, the threat of a civil explosion of Arab Spring is high. Right, the North Koreans don't care about their feeding their own people because they want to feed them. What they care about is feeding them so to make sure that you don't have bread riots that spiral into regime challenge. Right. right, and the markets provide enough to keep North Koreans from you know shooting each other and shooting guards in order to get something to eat. That's what really matters. So this isn't capitalism because they want it or anything. They're just sort of tolerating it because it's a useful prop for regime security. That, I would argue, is not actually the kind of conscious political change that we're looking for that's going to sort of win the, the hawk-dove debate for doves, right? I mean, what the doves need to show is not that South Korea is, North Korea is tolerating capitalism because they're afraid of a revolt. I mean, that's barely an accomplishment. What the doves need to show is that some kind of opening, some kind of genuine political opening, some kind of like real change is going on. Because I don't really think that's happened. I mean, we could dist- we could contest that. I mean, I understand doves can make lots of good arguments. We could fight over this all afternoon. However, I would argue that the general consensus the last 15 years is that North Korea hasn't really done that. And that has increasingly pushed 
I think, the academic and political debate regarding North Korea to the right. That's the that's the long answer. That's the sort of answer to your what has changed. I don't think the field itself has changed. I think you have a lot of people coming through doing Korean studies, political scientists who care about this stuff, people like me doing IR, historians. There's a lot of continuing focus on this, people in the United States and stuff like that. You have Western Europeans who do this stuff. So the academic discipline, the academic terrain, I don't think it's really that changed that much, though. The hawk dove debate is still there. What I do think, though, is that the polarization, the balance of the debate, is shifting slowly against the doves because North Korea's behavior just looks so damn intractable. It's like no matter what we do, it's like they don't stop. They just don't pull over. I mean, they had 10 years during the sunshine policy when South Korea was basically subsidizing them to change, to at least give us something, and they didn't, right? I mean, you know, the Kaesong Industrial Zone is a great example of this, right? Kaesong was opened with the hope that it would lead to sort of like these little mushrooms of small-scale capitalism sort of growing up around right. it, right? You'd have this kind of like organic spillover, right. right? It would be like this sort of little hole in the Iron Curtain and, you know, a little bit of sort of liberal market capitalism seep through, and you'd have like little mom-and-pop stores popping up around uh, the Kaesong Industrial Zone, you know, little bits of sort of entrepreneurialism at the grassroots and stuff like that. And that's that's not how the North Koreans treated it at all, right? I mean, the North Koreans treated it basically as... So the North Koreans basically treated the Kaesong Industrial Zone as an enclave economy. They put up walls all around it, and they treated it basically as a massive cash cow, which is why conservatives came out so hard against it, right? I mean, it, it's it's just really, really hard to find a good example of of genuine North Korean liberalization, not something that sort of happened by default and the regime had to make its peace with, the marketization, but but something where the regime said, okay, we're going to like lighten up the screws a little bit. We're going to let out some political prisoners or something like that, right? We're not going to assassinate people, defectors and stuff, right? If the North Koreans would stop doing that, that would give greater ammunition to the doves. And because they don't, I think this is why, I think this is why Korea elected two conservative presidents in a row. You know, I think, you know, the right's going to have a really hard time coming up because of the, the scandal, but I don't actually think that the Korean public really supports sustained engagement anymore. That's the big change I think that's going on. Is I think there's sort of a broad, cons- a growing consensus. I think there's a strong consensus in the U.S. government and in the Korean government, and a growing consensus in, in the analyst community that North Korea is not changing, and that more hawkish solutions are likely in the next decade. You mentioned consensus before, and what I'm curious is in your conversations, uh, in the writings that you encounter, and the books that you read. Do you sense a a big divergence in Korean scholars or, say, Westerners that are based out of Korea versus the D.C. think tank community? Um, I think Americans tend to be more hawkish. Part of that, especially the the think tanker community, part of I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One, they're simply more distant. Um, You know, they're not living on the firing line. I think one of the reasons why Koreans support engagement more is because if engagement doesn't work and at least genuine conflict, they're going to carry the costs. You know, this is one of the, I mean, I may be a hawk or a mild hawk on North Korea, but I'm definitely not a neocon. I certainly don't believe in bombing North Korea, provoking them into a conflict. Um, You know, and and because the South Koreans have to carry that cost. So ultimately, it's really up to the South Koreans to take that sort of risk. And this is one of the things that I dislike when I hear people like Bolton talk about, you know, John, John Bolton talk about, you know, going after North Korea. Because, I mean, we, the Americans, really shouldn't be doing that. South Korea needs to make that choice. But other than that, no, I think there, I think there's a fairly sort of, typical sort of hawk dove split here in in the united states i think the the lines sort of map relatively well on each other i would argue they're probably more american hawks than there are doves um in korea they're probably more they're probably more doves here but no i i don't i i mean the united states and south korea are so close there's so much interaction on defense and security issues right i mean people just sort of slide back and forth in this community you know i go to conferences on this stuff in the united states i go to conferences on this stuff in korea I mean, there's just so much interaction that I think you have kind of like a fairly singular epistemic community of people who all share the sort of same assumptions, right? I mean, the, the big divide the big divide is, do you believe the North Koreans will respond to carrots or not, right? I mean, if you offer them something, will they take it and change? That's what everybody's arguing about. And nobody really knows because the North Koreans don't share with us enough. So it's really hard for us to make reasonable predictions, which is why we have the same kind of fights again and again. And so now we have a new American president, right? Donald Trump just came in. And if you sort of like, if you look at like foreign affairs and the blogs and, you know, I don't know, the national interest or whatever, you know, if you look at the community out there, right, you're seeing the same debate you see every time we have a new president, right? Should we engage them? And the Hawks push back and say, no, we shouldn't. And you sort of go around and around and we all say the same sorts of things, which is unhelpful. <laughs> um, you know, 
we could talk forever about North Korea. And, I, could. and I, I think that most, I think that any discussion with a political scientist based in South Korea will inevitably lead to North Korea. But I want to get your opinion on what is a really underappreciated political science theory or political science perspective that gets very undercovered in Korea or doesn't get as much attention as it should? I would say there are a couple of things that sort of strike me. If if I weren't in international relations, if I had skills in other areas, a couple of things I think that that sort of strike me. One, the pace of modernization in South Korea has been really, really accelerated. And I'm actually quite impressed at how South Korea manages to contain the pressures that that should unleash. I'm actually quite impressed that Korea doesn't have some kind of like vigorous anti-capitalist, anti-globalist, reactionary sort of throwback. Like a Trump party. Sort of like that. You know, something, you know, some kind of like, you know, like, you know, I mean, Korea was a monarchy for a long time. I mean, it wasn't a very rigorous monarchy. Korea's monarchy was pretty weak. But I mean, Korea was a monarchy for a really long time. And you don't have a, a monarchist party of any kind. I mean, you you should have some kind of like throwback, party, even if it gets a couple percent. You don't have that. You don't have any kind of like fascist party. You have nothing like Marine Le Pen in Korea, even though modernization in Korea took place within like a space of a generation, right? I mean, you still have Koreans who are old enough to remember when, you know, like the war, when people didn't have shoes. And that sort of amazes and me, these right? these are the because same people now driving Mercedes Benz to their right. seaside penthouse. Right, their, their, their kids are driving, there. yeah. Their kids um, are driving. And yeah. I think that, I think, but I think, you know, I think political science is often assumed, right? certainly in the West, I think we, you know, we saw and therefore assumed that modernization was this really, really traumatic process that kicked up uh, Marxism and fascism in the West. I think modernization is partially responsible for the dislocations in the Arab world and the creation of Salafi jihadism. That's also sort of a response to like these massive intrusions of modern democratic capitalism, particularly in the Persian Gulf. And you don't really have a big response like that here, which is actually pretty surprising. Another thing I think that's sort of undercovered or under-researched or whatever is um, the the weird underpowerment, that's a terrible word, the weird lack of weight of the Korean legislature. Korean government is technically the sort of standard democratic tripartite system, executive, judicial, legislative, but the Korean legislature is kind of a joke. What you have here is a very, very highly presidentialized system in which you have a kind of elected five-year monarch. The press in Korea is also weak, in part because there's a lot of sort of corporate interference and the government doesn't share information, right? You know, Park and Hay only gave one press conference a year and it was highly stage managed and stuff like that. So the the fourth estate is a weak check on the, the power of the president, which effectively means that the president kind of rules as something like this, you know, sort of like a monarch for about three and a half to four years, at which time the lame duck effect of the five-year term, the single five-year term, begins to kick in. And then in the last, you know, year to year and a half, people stop paying attention to the president and start looking forward to the next race. So that is a very strange and I would argue unhealthy system, right, where where the primary check on the president is sort of the timing out of his or her term. To be fair to the Koreans, the, the Korean court system has emerged, I think, as an important check. You know, the, the Supreme Court's role in the impeachment right now is proving to Koreans, showing Koreans that you want an independent judiciary that takes rule of law really seriously and isn't subject to politicization and isn't subject to all these protests on the street. I mean, the you know, I hope that when the, the, the verdict comes down, whichever way it goes, that you know, the Koreans don't protest it and say, you know, oh, we have to overturn it by marching in the street. That's not the way the rule of law works, right? Supreme Court justices in Korea, or the constitutional court justices in Korea should not make this decision based on who can put more people in the street with more flags. And if the Koreans accept that that's a big step forward and that that's an important part of the judiciary checking the executive the real problem though is that the legislature here is so weak right that there's not a lot of respect for it you know that they, they throw chairs at each other and they use chainsaws to cut down the doors and all these kinds of things so if i were a comparative politics scholar that's something i would look at where you have this sort of you know underpowered legislature that acts as a weak check on a president that kind of rules with you know sort of like as like a like an elected monarch right I guess, the, I guess the other thing that really sort of strikes me, you know, if I were a sociologist, I guess, is the way that Korea, South Korea, South both Koreas, defines itself against Japan. This is something that a lot of foreigners sort of see, um, the sort of Korean obsession, the hang-up bordering on obsession with Japan. You know, I remember what is like a couple years ago when Shinzo Abe seemed to be getting along famously with Barack Obama and the Korean media like freaked out. And there were all these articles, you know, will Obama welcome, you know, the Korean government and, you know. Uh, Park and Hay, the same way that uh, Obama welcomed Abe, and you know when the Korean media perceived that not to happen, there were all these calls for the Korean foreign minister to resign and stuff like that. I mean, the Korean Koreans really, really focus on Japan, right? I mean, it's just it's just a part of the the national culture here, and um, that's a really interesting question. Why? Because a lot of other states 
had experience with colonialism. They sort of move on and stuff like that. And the Koreans continue to sort of like bang away at this colonial narrative with Japan. And it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting case. Like why? Like why Why do the Koreans sort of not move beyond this, right? I mean, the Korean answer is to say, well, you know, Japan did a lot of terrible stuff here. I, that's true. But I mean, a lot of terrible stuff has happened in, in world history, right? I mean, it's curious that Koreans continue to sort of go over this and over this and over this. Sort of like, for example, like the analogization between the comfort women and the Holocaust, right? And comfort women was maybe 100 to 200,000. Women in the Holocaust was 8 to 10 million people who were exterminated, right? I mean, most people would say that, that those two things are not morally equal. But, but you know, Korean academics routinely tell me they are. I think for Western, for outside Western analysts, for people like me, certainly in my experience, I mean, this is just something that we just don't get. And this really needs to be written about. And it's not just about, you know, oh, you know, what, uh, you know, what kind of schools Japan set up when they were here. I and mean, there's something going on in, in South Korean identity where Japan has become sort of like this, this other against which South Korea has built its its own national identity, and that's why sort of these narratives of of you know Japan. That's why you know you always hear the Koreans always tell me that you know Japan is about to remilitarize. Well, actually, in international relations, nobody believes that, right? Japan spends less than one percent of GDP on defense. If anything, Japan's defense is underpowered. Actually, I would actually it's argued substantially underpowered, right? And when I say that in Korea, people are like <gasps> really, I'm like yes, <laughs> right? And, and this cries out for explanation. Some some sociologist has to go off and write a book about you know how Koreans sort of use Japan to sort of create a, a sense of national identity. I, I just, I don't know the, uh, I just don't know the answer. In what ways has your views of East Asia, of Asia in general, of Korea changed from before you moved here to now? I would say that I have become more pessimistic about international politics now that I live here and I see it. I used to sort of, I guess, have the kind of American style end of history, liberal faith that, you know, if we all join democratic capitalism and could buy the Blu-ray players and nice suits and send our kids to good schools, you know, all that kind of stuff that we could sort of smother nationalism in, uh, you know, the the riches of, of modern capitalism. And that, that worked relatively well in the European Union. Um, it just doesn't work out here. I mean, it's, it's weird. I mean, as, you know, coming to Asia sort of like going back to like 1913. <laughs> it's like going back to this world where... You're not the, that old, are you? No, not yet. Um, but it's like going back to the sort of like 19th century world of nation states that are sort of hotly competing with one another over things that I think a lot of us in the West would argue are probably not worth the the, the fight. You know, so the, the territorial disputes being the most obvious, right? I mean, do you really want to – Korea and Japan really want to go to war over Dokdo? Do Japan and China really want to go to war over Senkaku? I mean, these – to Westerners who sort of watch World War I get fought over Elsass Lorraine or something like that, these questions answer themselves. You know, I mean, a friend of mine once said, you know, that the, the Asians are one good war away from the liberal democratic peace. In other words, they need to go through something like World War One before they realize they need to stop building large militaries and tone down the nationalism and stuff like that. That's a real shame if that's how it turns out to be. But Asia's, Asia is very sort of modernist. That is to say that it is sort of very sort of like Hegelian, right? There's a focus on territory and the state and the sort of long, often trumped up fake national historiography, right? You have sort of this glorious two or three or four or five thousand year history, you know, and stuff like that. A lot of that is sort of constructed for national identity purposes. You have territorial disputes. You have sort of blood and soil myths. You, you know, it's also been incredibly myths. stable for decades. Right, right. We'll get to that, right? But the point is that you have sort of like a lot of trends that remind a lot of Western observers of the 19th century. That's why you get all these sort of discussions about sort of is, you know, Europe's past, Asia's future, and, you know, China as imperial Germany and stuff like that. So that that's the biggest concern. That's the biggest thing that I have. I mean, this is something that I always say when I when I speak in in Korea, right? It's sort of like lighten up on the nationalism, right? Just try you know try to get along with one another, right? I mean, you know, I mean, that's why there are no real Asian international institutions out here because they just don't really want to actually be with them. You know, I go to these conferences and people are like, oh, well, we're gonna have an Asian monetary union or an Asian version of the EU, and I'm like, no, because you don't like each other enough, right? I mean, you're just too, you just you know, you're all just sort of at each other's throats, and and that's that. That is what worries me the most. I mean, I, I sort of accept the basic argument that that nationalism is a pretty important permissive cause of war. The Europeans learned this the hard way, and the European Union was designed explicitly to prevent that. And I think Asia just isn't there. Maybe they will get there. But that's that's the biggest concern that I have, right, is that you just have politicians who stay stuff out here. You know, like, look at the Chinese right now over Thad, right? I mean, the Chinese are taking Thad, and they're going way over the top, and they're closing down you know, tours to South Korea and stuff like that. I mean, this this stuff is ben, dangerous, ben right? I mean, you're, tours you know, you're and... playing with fire with this kind of stuff, right? 
And and so that's what I am most concerned about, right? Is I just Asia is much more nationalistic than I had anticipated when I came here. I I didn't expect this. I thought that because people always because a lot of the people that I read, they're always like, well, you know, like a, like history is so important for Asians and stuff like that. Well, if that's really true, then you should actually see a greater role for feudalism and Confucianism and stuff like that. You know, like where is that Korean Monarchist Party? Actually, I would argue that modernization has been super successful in Asia, and that you actually have highly, you know, like Europe in the nineteenth century after the Industrial Revolution, after nationalism, you've got highly nationalized populations, you've got highly modernized economies, you've got big armies, got a lot of weapons, right? I mean, that looks an awful lot like Western Europe in the 1890s, right? I mean, that doesn't mean the analogies have to be exactly perfect or something like that. Ideally, the Asians would learn from what the Europeans did and not make the same mistakes. But it's not clear to me, actually, that, you know, for all this talk about Korea's glorious 5,000-year history and China goes back to, you know, whatever, the first Han kingdom, stuff like that, for all that sort of talk about the glorious history out here, I'm not actually sure that that really informs their modern politics, right? I mean, it strikes me that most of their politics out here are pra- international relations are practiced out here in fairly traditional nationalist kind of way, arguing over territory, arguing over who's putting what where and stuff like that. All that is fairly typical interstate balance of power kind of stuff. At what point did you decide, I want to be a professor and I want to study international relations? Oh, uh, well, the uh, the desire to be a college professor, that goes all the way back um, to when I was a kid. My dad was a professor. My dad is a great scholar. He's since retired, um, much better than I am, actually. My father is a historian of the um, early Catholic Church, which is ridiculously arcane. <laughs> he, the field is called patristics, the study of the early church fathers, and he's very, very good. From him, I sort of got the bug to be in the profession. I thought it was so cool that my dad was like, Dr. Kelly. <laughs> that was so amazing when I was like 10 years old. And so I always wanted to I – had, I had sort of always kind of figured I'd be an academic. I sort of flirted with politics a couple times. Like I said, I worked in Germany for a while for the in the German legislature, and I worked for the U.S. Congress and um, for various politicians in um, Ohio in the 1990s. Um, Ohio guy, was where you're from? Yes, I'm from Cleveland. And I worked for a congressman from Cleveland. Unfortunately, he uh, lost his reelection bid, one of the only incumbents not to get reelected. <laughs> so after that um, – after that – what rug was pulled out from under me i um, went to graduate school i was in my late mid 20s mid 20s and um, where did you end up you were at i went to ohio state i went to um, i did my undergraduate work at miami university of ohio which is a little bit north of cincinnati and then so then i went to ohio state in columbus they have a pretty good phd program i don't know it's in the top 15 or 20 or something like that last time i checked and the international relations section is is pretty good. And, um, you know, I had enjoyed living abroad. I mean, I, you know, I had gone to Germany when I was a graduate student or when I was an undergraduate student. I had studied languages. I By the time I finished college, I spoke German and French pretty well. So I always kind of thought I wanted to do international relations. And it just kind of went from there. Um, what appeals to you about Germany? Oh, that's because I thought I was going to be like a modern European historian for a while. You know, I thought World War One and World War Two were really fascinating. You know, Bismarck and Napoleon and stuff like that. You know, I'd like watch those ridiculous documentaries on the History Channel about Napoleon, like blowing off the nose of the Sphinx in Egypt, and you know, and that kind of crazy stuff. All that sort of stuff. You know, that, that I just thought was was pretty was pretty fascinating. Um, but um, did you ever consider Asia at that time? No, I mean, I was from Ohio. I didn't know anything about that kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't know what I know about Asia when I was 10. Nothing. I think I watched Hawaii Five O. You knew enough about Bismarck and Napoleon. I, right, right. No, I just no, I just I just didn't know. No, that 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 came later when I was in when I was in graduate school. How was your experience at Ohio State? Graduate school is hard in political science. I liked Ohio State. I got a lot out of it. It's a it was a good school that opened a lot of doors for me. I struggled in my first few years because I didn't really understand what through a PhD program in political science in the social sciences meant it was much more quantitative than I had expected. It was much more methodological. It was much more sort of obsessed with science than I had anticipated. Yeah, I think it's even more so now. Yes, I think it is. 20 plus years in the future. That's right. Uh, and that, that's actually something, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about this. That's actually something I'm rather uncomfortable with. I don't think that people choose to major in political science because they like math or statistics. I think that we have gone down that route so far that we're actually at risk of becoming incomprehensible to regular people. It's kind of following the economist route, right? right? Where they, they try so hard to prove themselves as a real science, as a hard science, as a, as a STEM kind of field that they forget their qualitative credentials that yeah. make, make the field interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, yeah. A lot of people sort of make that argument. This is a huge debate. We could also sort of spend half an hour talking about too, but yes, I think, I think in brief, I think there's a lot of concern or there's a lot of desire in the social sciences to look like science, but we're dealing with human beings who are not 
really law-like animals. It's really sort of hard to map human behavior in sort of like these formal laws. I think the best discipline in the social sciences to do that is economics. Um, I think this is probably why economics has a, has a Nobel Prize. Economics, I think, has tried to pattern itself off of physics, and we in political science have in turn tried to pattern ourselves off of economics. Um, I think you hear, you know, you, you used to hear, I don't know if people say this anymore, but I mean, people used to say that like political science is just like a subfield of economics because they're closed down political science and push it into econ. We can't be economics. We cannot. We in political science, I would argue that we actually study a field that's more important than economics, right? I would say that the state is actually of greater relevance than the details of supply and demand because those details the the specific the, the market wouldn't really operate without the state right a lot of what we take for granted that comes from economics actually requires first a political foundation to frame and structure economic relations so i would actually argue that political science is a more important discipline than economics but i'm sure every discipline can make an argument for why they should be supreme um anyway the point is we shouldn't be economics because one we're not and two i don't think we can be but we we have this sort of desire to 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 look like that and i think that's part of the the drive behind the mathematization of our discipline what i worry about like i said is a recruitment i'm not really sure if people like yourself sort of young people in their 20s and stuff like that who are thinking about this want to go into political science if they think all they're going to do is learn math i i don't think that's why people go into this discipline they they go in because they read thucydides or something or they read 1984 or you know, they, they, they read about the 30 Years War or, you know, whatever, Japan and Korea, you know, whatever. I and mean, they read about something that really fascinated them in sort of the sociopolitical life of mankind. That's why they go in. And we need to make sure people don't lose that and feel like they have to become sort of, you know, math, you know, calculators in order to get through the discipline. Um, I also worry about our ability to communicate with the larger public if we continue to go down this sort of mathematization route. If, if regular people cannot read our journals, you know, our journals, then ultimately they're going to wonder why are we funding you, right? I mean, academia is highly dependent on public funding because we produce work that doesn't really appeal to any one particular constituency deeply, so people don't usually pay for it. We produce, you know, a public good, which is why we rely heavily on state funding, right? I mean, look at Korea, all these national universities. Well, if we alienate the state funders so much that they're like, why are we paying for this stuff, we can't even read it, then ultimately that will hurt us. Well, to bring it back to Korea, do you find that the field suffers from those same problems here? No, actually, probably the other way. I would actually argue that Korean uni- Korean academia is actually too policy relevant, that Korean un- Korean academia, Korean international relations is actually too close to the state. There needs to be a greater Chinese wall between political science in Korea and the state and think tanks. We shouldn't be an arm of the government. Think tanks do that already. Think tanks crank out so many position papers in favor of extant policy, Right. And the whole reason for tenure is to make sure that academics are saying things that you're not hearing from the state and from state funded think tanks. Right. And you want people to say something different and new. That's why I find I actually don't read think tank work that much anymore. I almost always read academics because at least they're telling me something new. Right. I don't need to read yet another article from the Council of Foreign Relations telling me yet again the same thing about the American liberal world order. I've been reading that stuff since college. So I would actually like to see a greater sort of disjuncture in Korea. But I mean, that's sort of, you know, you know, Asian, that's really not sort of Asian political science or sort of like clubbier and stuff like that, right? Where you have sort of these linkages and stuff like that. I don't know, maybe that's just the American and me arguing for sort of these these greater divisions because that's just not how it's done here. But I think that does make Korean political science not scientific enough, which is why Korean journals just don't have the kind of high rankings. They just don't compete as well against Western journals because I think in part because of this, this powerful push to be policy relevant, which if I can keep on droning on here, I think is actually kind of understandable, though, because there is this big push in Korean political science, international relations to help figure out the North Korea problem. Korean academics are not just sort of policy relevant because, you know, they're lazy or they don't care about science or something like that. I mean, maybe some are, but I don't think that's really the reason. I think the real reason is because they got North Korea breathing down their neck. In the same way that international relations as a discipline was designed and was created in the 50s and 60s to help figure out how to win the Cold War for the Americans. Like, what are we doing here? Like, what is the Soviet Union? How do we respond? You know, a lot of IR came about as a response to the Cold War and to help the Americans win. I think that's part of what Korean international relations and political science is doing. I think it's roped to this larger policy issue. Of what do we do about this state north of us that we don't understand, that threatens us, that's really frightening? And so there's this really, really powerful need for good, intelligent people to think deeply about North Korea and tell the government what to do. Now, how about the students? In terms of their comprehension of the issue, in terms of their grasp of these these concepts, how do you feel that the Korean students are approaching these types of problems? Is, is it a significant difference than, say, the American counterparts? No, I think they get it. The real issue is just the language barrier. You know, if their English is good enough, they get it. If it's not, they don't. 
I, I find as a general rule that Korean university students are about the same as what I taught back in the United States. Um, I taught at Ohio State for many years. Ohio State is sort of like a big mid-range sort of American university, right? Sort of a fairly good, you know, sort of medium. There's, there's a lot of complaints about the Korean education system that they're basically just creating these drones, right. these robots that will just basically spit out whatever it is you're lecturing about. What has been your experience? Um, yes, broadly speaking, I do think that Korean academia needs to emphasize creativity rather than rote recitation. I don't, a lot of people have said that before me, and I, I'm not sure I have much to add to that. Um, but it's, it's not clear to me that Korean students couldn't be pushed to do that. I mean, my best students are on par or better than my best students were in the United States. I, again, I just don't, PNU is, I mean, I tell people, PNU is like the Ohio State of Korea, right? And I'm sure, I mean, you're at Korea University. It's a, I'm sure it's if a I good went school, there, but it's not Harvard. Yeah. And I'm sure that if I went to Korea University, I'd have students that would be sort of, you know, like whatever you would get back in the United States and Brown or something like that. I'm, I'm, I just I just I just don't see major distinctions in terms of sort of quality. I guess the, the, the biggest issue I see in Korea, honestly, is sort of like a gender a gender differentiation one, right, where females in Korea are starting to really seriously outperform male students. I think I think you see that in the U.S. as well. Yeah, that's a I global mean, trend, from what I understand. Even just enrollments as well. I, I believe in the U.S., especially Canada. Yeah, I think this is this is sort of. I think this is a global trend. That's my understanding. I, I don't know. I'm you know, but um, no. I mean, I'm just trying to think of sort of the Koreans. Is there anything sort of really different with them? Um, no. I mean, I, I find Koreans are are more polite. They're more deferent to professors, which in one way is nice. It's sort of flattering, right? You know, they bow to you or something. Like that. Nobody ever bowed to me in the United States. On the other hand, it's sort of a shame because they don't raise their hand to sort of provoke you as much. Although if they speak English well enough, they will actually fight back. And that's fun, too, because that's what you want, ultimately, right? You don't want students who are like robots, right? What you really want are students who are like, you're wrong, Dr. Kelly, and I'm going to tell you why. All right? That's much more interesting. That makes the whole process worth it. Yeah, I, I don't I don't find that they're sort of one way or the other much better. The only thing I would add to that, though, I mean, what's kind of surprising about that, though, and I, I think that maybe Korean parents should sort of consider this, is that if you think about the Hagwon system, the fact that in what we in the United States refer to as K-12, through during this K-12 through time in Korea, Korean parents often send their kids to these punishing Hagwon systems, right, where they're going to school for not like six or eight hours like we did, but, you know, for like 10 or 12, they're going to school until 9 or 10 o'clock at night. So if you have American kids who go to school in K-12 through and they go like seven hours a day, and you have Koreans who go like 13 hours a day, by the time they get to college... Shouldn't the Korean students be like way, way better than the Americans after all that money and time and suffering and anguish and heartache and family fighting and all that? Well, when I get them, they're not. I mean, I've said this repeatedly at conferences. Again, you know, I mean, I teach at a mid-range kind of place. I teach like the Ohio State of Korea. You know, maybe if I was teaching at the Harvard of Korea, the Princeton would be different. But no, I think it'd be very much the same. I, I okay, and then then that see then that just tells me that not only is the Hagwon system sort of brutal on families and ridiculously expensive, it's also a massive waste of time, right? Because you're putting in this gigantic investment in these kids, and then when they show up in my classes, they're not substantially better. I mean, I expect. I mean, after all, I'm the Hag, after the Hagwon stories I hear from my students, I expect them to walk into my classes and they're like, I can speak Russian, and I've been to Mongolia, and I can, you know, do differential calculus. I mean, I really, I expect I can tell them to you walk all about in Napoleon, there. right? No, but I expect them to walk in with massive skill sets because of all the training, and they don't. They don't walk in with anything better than what I got back in the United States, which makes me wonder why the hell would you put them through these brutal systems? If you're doing all this, shouldn't there be a payoff? If there's not, then you're wildly over investing education and getting very little for it uh, that that genuinely baffles me because i kind of once i learned about how like insane the hagwon system in here i mean like like why aren't they better and if they're going to boot camp when they're 14 if they're going to like boot camp for their brain when they're 14 or 15 why aren't they just like amazing when they're 17 or 18 in my class and actually they're not they're just normal 18 year olds all right we're getting towards the end of the interview we're gonna have a few rapid fire questions here please take your time answer them as long as you would like what is your favorite thing about living in Korea compared to the United States or Germany? Well, compared to the United States, that's easy. It's safe. I mean, I don't want to get too political here, but I really do appreciate the fact that Koreans are not armed. And I do appreciate the fact that you can walk down the street at night at like two in the morning after having a couple of beers and not get jumped. It's by not the hard streets of Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. I mean, Cleveland's a lot better now than it used to be. But in the 70s and 80s, when I was growing up, it was bad. You just don't have that here. And I really appreciate that. You know, they just they don't have the drug epidemic. I mean, you just don't have people doing ecstasy and stuff like that. I mean, you know, you just don't have all that kind of stuff that I support drug legal liberalization, but it's nice to not be around people who are getting high all the time, which, you know, I can certainly remember when I was growing up. Anyway, the point is that that Korea is safe. You just don't have a lot of violence here, which is really nice. I mean, I got two kids. I don't have to worry about them and stuff like that. I don't have to worry about some guy driving up in a van, you know, when they're at the kindergarten. I mean, you just don't have that kind of 
social violence here, which is just phenomenal. I don't know why. I don't know. This is not my area at all. But I do appreciate the fact you don't have it that people aren't carrying a weapon. I mean, I, I love the fact that the police here are like friendly and approachable and like a lot of them don't even carry a weapon. I mean, the United States, they look like Darth Vader now after 9-11. So they look like SEAL Team 6. Yeah. So that's that. That's the thing that I like the most. I, I, you know, it's it's safe. You just don't have to worry about. It. You can go downtown at night and something. Like, yeah, you know, I remember like in Cleveland. Oh my God, man! You know, it's like you just couldn't drive downtown. You know, after the Indians game or something like that, everybody went home. Right, you had to walk immediately to your car and drive home because nobody wanted to go to a bar in the middle of downtown Cleveland or something like that because you were afraid that you know your car would get smashed into or something like that. And you just don't have that here, right? I mean, the city is open in the evening, which is something Americans, you know, I mean, with suburbanization and stuff like that, you know, people just aren't used to that in the United States. And so here it's really nice. What are three books that you would recommend to better understand Northeast Asia, Korea, or just three books that you've been reading recently that you would really recommend to a friend? That is actually a really good question. I'm trying to think of something really sort of leaps off the page. I guess the standard answer about Korea, I mean, the one that sort of everybody reads, I think, when they come here, is The Two Koreas by Don Oberdorfer. Uh, Oberdorfer passed away two or three years ago. The third edition of that book was co-authored with somebody. Um, I can't remember his name. Um, I read that. Everybody I know read it. Everybody I know has it on their shelf. What else? Not necessarily related to Korea, but just two or three books that you would recommend to anybody to read to better understand the discipline. Oh, International Relations? As it relates to Northeast Asia. I would say, I'm trying to think if there's one specific book. I would, the, I would, I would recommend an author. I would recommend David Kang of the University of Southern California. Um, Dave's been a friend of mine for a long time. You know, he's written a book on China. He's got another book coming out. He's written a book on um, East Asia before Western imperialists showed up around the time of the Opium War. You know, if you read sort of the think tanker stuff, you know, if you read the stuff you get from like, you know, Council of Foreign Relations and Foreign Affairs and stuff like that, it's all sort of like the Americans and the Chinese are going to clash and there's going to be like these aircraft carrier battles in the East China Sea. You know, drones and missiles. This stuff has been said and said and said and said and said so many times. Like I said, I just don't even read this think tank stuff that much anymore because it's just the same thing again and again. One of the reasons why I like Dave is that he says a lot of interesting counterintuitive stuff. I assign Dave's work all the time when I teach because it's because it tells you something new. I mean, I don't actually agree with him about a lot of stuff. I actually do think that a Sino-American collision in East Asia is kind of likely. In that sense, I guess I'm fairly conventional. But at least Dave is trying to tell you something different. You know, sort of like Bruce Cummings on North Korea, right? I mean, I really, really disagree disagree with him on North Korea. But at least he's telling you something new. I mean, that's important because, I mean, the, the talking points from Washington about East Asia are so stale. I just, you just don't even need to read it anymore, right? It was like neocons on East Asia or neocons in the Middle East. I mean, it's just been saying the same thing for 20 years. So, okay, so Dave is somebody I would recommend. I'm trying to think if there's anyone else that, that really sort of leaps off the page to me. What am I reading right now? Right now I'm reading articles, actually. We, we can keep it at uh, two, two yeah, careers. Might, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, okay. yeah this is, I don't, I mean, I, I, well, here, I, okay, let me make one other suggestion, one other suggestion um, in terms of sort of like reading material. Let me make a journal recommendation, and that is the Korean Journal of Defense Analysis, which is published by the Korean Institute for Defense Analysis. K uh, KJDA is the best ranked journal in Korea. Um, it's got the highest SSCI ranking, SSCI ranking in Korea. It's not very high, but I actually think KJDA is a pretty good journal that's kind of underread and underappreciated. I I've published there myself once. I'm going to send something there in about a month or so. And I actually think they do a pretty good job. I think they actually really try to make sure that they have good sort of English language, theoretically rigorous work on Korean security. So if you're actually sort of doing what I'm doing, I, you know, and you can get it for free through their website. I mean, that's what I would recommend. So read KJDA. It'll really get you up to speed really fast on what's going on, right? And we got all these really smart people in Seoul and the think tanks and the big universities all basically saying, here's what we should be doing with North Korea. You get a lot of straight up information about Korea, South Korea's relationships with North Korea, Japan, and China. You know, Dave will then give you sort of the counterintuitive take by telling you all kinds of stuff that like China's not what you think it is and we can get along with North Korea. It's very sort of interesting and counterintuitive. And then, yeah, if you don't know anything about Korea, which, you know, a lot of people don't, then Oberdorfer is a great place to start. Dr. Kelly, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.